Drunk Elephant is a fascinating brand. They didn't really invent their first product, they didn't invent clean beauty nor non-toxic cosmetics, but what they did was market all of those things exceptionally well until their sale to an unexpected parent company. But why then, only a couple of years later after their sale, has everything gone to pot and the company has lost nearly all of its initial buzz? The story for Drunk Elephant begins before the brand does in 2009 when founder Tiffany Masterson was either working for a Malaysian company named Wonder Bar or working as a salesperson for her brother-in-law who was importing the Wonder Bar. Depending on the source depends on the story that's told. The bar was not technically a soap, but it was a cleanser meant to detoxify the skin using nearly all natural ingredients, including Hailmore clay, which was the primary ingredient. However, having seen that the product was too expensive, per bar it was $40, and that the margin was too small, she left the company in around 2010-2011 to implement what she had learned from Wonderbar in making her own products. I bring this up specifically because their first item developed was the Juju Bar, and was an extremely similar product to the Wonder Bar. Both were based off of Hillmore clay, or as Drunk Elephant call it, thermal mud, and the Wonder Bar's first ingredient, disodium lauryl sulfosuccinate, which is a sulfate-free anionic surfactant meant for lathering purposes, is the second ingredient listed in the Jeju Bar today. I'm no chemist, I very much struggle pronouncing that, nor am I a dermatologist, and probably more research does need to go into this because I do not consider myself to be much knowledgeable on cosmetic product itself, I personally prefer the marketing and branding side, but it's certainly interesting that they have such close similarities. Though perhaps that shouldn't come as a surprise when Masterson never claimed that she didn't like the Wonder Bar, just that it was expensive and the margin was too small. And she has also quite explicitly said that she was using what she had learned in Wonder Bar in her products, so she's always been quite honest about her chemical inspiration. However, actually, by the time Drunk Elephant launched, their similarities didn't actually matter all that much because Wonder Bar had already discontinued their bar, which we can assume was because of the reasons Masterson outlined earlier, namely that it was too expensive. Saying that, it makes sense why, therefore, the Juju Bar would retail for $32 $8 less than the Wonder Bar, showing that potentially she found ways to cut costs with the manufacturing or was just happy with a larger cut of a smaller profit margin at launch. It was this product, after all, that came to inform the other five products that would be available come launch in 2013. And this was no small launch. Starting 2012, the company found independent backers to the tune of $300,000 with which they set up their website and prepared product packaging in LA, or before August 2013 when the brand did officially launch with six products. They had the Juju Bar that we discussed earlier, the TLC Frambuze Glycolic Night Serum, Umbra Sheer Physical Defense, the Peaky Bar, Virgin Marula Luxury Face Oil, and a C Firma Day Serum or with the mentality of reducing the chemical formula to the bare bones of what is necessary while concomitantly using convoluted names for their products in an effort to make the products and their formulas seem more methodical or scientific, with the obvious exceptions being the Peaky Bar and the Juju Bar that were more of a callback to the story of the name Drunk Elephant, which is an African myth that elephants eat fallen marula fruits and get drunk of the aged sugars, which, in fairness, was all used in the marketing. From launch, it seems to have actually started quite slowly. They had a blog review on CosmeticMonster.com that raved about the brand, and they were featured on Refinery29 in December of the same year. So in contrast to most of the other brands that we've discussed here on this channel, the brand saw truly organic growth at this early stage, spreading slowly but surely through word-of-mouth reviews and their unique take on the industry for their quote, non-toxic products. In fact, this term non-toxic was probably fundamental in that growth. On launch, their feature on CEW.org claims that a new category was born with the invention of Drunk Elephant's products. And this is semi-true. The term non-toxic in regards to beauty did exist before, as we can see from this blog post dated in 2011, but what's interesting about the blog post is that they struggle to recommend any ready-made products. 
though with one company by far coming out on top, Sally B's Skin Yummies that was founded in 2005. Sally B's Skin Yummies still does exist. Their website was a bit temperamental, but it did work in the end. They also still post on Instagram, though they have very little engagement, but are still recommended by green slash organic communities. It's just that the brand read very much like a small brand. It honestly still does today, and it's easy to see why their reach was able to be overtaken. Sally B had a great idea, and back in 2012 were probably the market leader in this quote non-toxic niche. But unlike Drunk Elephant, who had independent backers, probably didn't have the resources to market it properly. They don't even use the term non-toxic themselves in the marketing very much at all, though they have been using the term since 2012, so before Drunk Elephant launched. However, in comparison, Drunk Elephant had a catchy name, a great origin story, a funny naming story, and they had framed marula oil as the next miracle ingredient for the beauty world, something that this video calls a star ingredient. So it doesn't take a genius to work out why Drunk Elephant quickly surpassed their competition and caught the attention of consumers, bloggers, and media outside of that niche significantly faster. By 2015, they had become stocked in Sephora, a real milestone for many brands, and they seemingly dropped their price to $28, although I couldn't find out specifically when or why that happened, though it seems to have led to their biggest growth year so far, 2016. Their social media had completely transformed from a personal brand sharing pictures of their, I want to say Tibetan terrier, dog, Bruno, to sharing their PR successes in a very 2010s curated feed that well represented the brand online for the period. Drunk Elephant in this time was legitimizing, and it was legitimizing quickly. So quickly, in fact, that only three years after launch, there were already rumors that the brand was the next best acquisition in beauty. They had retail sales of 4 million for 2015, projections of 20 million in 2016, with Sephora's top growth skincare brand for 2016, and in fact was their fastest growing skincare brand in the history of Sephora, riding that wave that was the rise of skincare. Specifically, there were rumors that Estee Lauder was looking to buy the company at this point, and there were even rumors that they had put in an offer, but was instead turned down in trade for funding from VMG, who acquired an undisclosed minor stake in the business, and funding from Leandra Medine of Man Repeller. This investment, in turn, funded the company to bring on a new head team that subsequently put the brand into growth overdrive and poised themselves for the huge rise in clean cosmetics. Specifically for this, the team overhauled the marketing. They reframed and marketed previously removed ingredients as their Suspicious Six, a genius way to make their clean branding stick in the consumer's mind that saw them quadruple sales between 2016 and 2018, making over $100 million in net sales for the year, despite being exclusive to Sephora in the US and Canada, and despite having their first scandal after they were accused of copying the vitamin C formula from SkinCeuticals and got sued for copyright infringement. In fact, that didn't even really make a dent in their popularity because there was so much hype around the company from a consumer standpoint and it was cheaper than the SkinCeuticals version. In fact, it didn't even stop the rumors over who would eventually buy the brand and instead seemed to kind of fuel that. This growth truly is an incredible feat for any independent company. But they had the right product at the right time and it filled a new desire for customers to have uncomplicated effective skincare, enough to get it noted and recommended endlessly by people like Hiram who boosted the company profile massively. It reminds me of something that I was told when I was in university of if you have no problem for you to fix in marketing, you create a problem and you fix the problem that you have invented. With the example that my professor gave of deodorant that was invented around 100 years ago to fix the newly invented problem that our underarm smell is unclean or unladylike, which it was not considered as before, but companies like Mum and Odorono specifically targeted women, convincing them that it was unladylike to have underarm smell and specifically that it would scare away men and a prospective husband. 
This, of course, continues to happen today with things like women's razor blades that invented the problem of body hair for women in order to make more sales outside of their predominantly male market. Which, of course, all links into Drunk Elephant as they weren't the first nor the last clean brand, but they were the best at marketing toxins in skincare as a problem, and it was through this that the brand now held so much value that they finally sold for $845 million to Shiseido Japan. This was a bit of an unexpected choice for the company, not because Shiseido wasn't a good choice, but because they were quite new to the Western cosmetics space. Owning brands like Bare Minerals, Laura Mercier and NARS before buying Drunk Elephant since having come from the tech space. Though, in their legal filings for acquisition, Shiseido covered their reasoning for the purchase, noting that the decision was made as Shiseido's attempt for repositioning themselves in the West and specifically North American market as the leader in the non-toxic natural cosmetics niche, especially in the prestige skincare category and just generally to drive sales and profits in the region something a few brands had previously tried to replicate for themselves with their own brands with the growing clean beauty trend, but had struggled to make work because it's harder to integrate into already made logistics than to make it from scratch, and it's harder to sell to consumers who know you previously in a toxic way instead of a non-toxic way. However, though the sale was interesting, things didn't really go to plan. Not too long after the sale, the ongoing critique that Drunk Elephant had a rather defensive social media team started to see more traction. With this video from Hiram detailing why he no longer will promote the brand, having been a major champion for the company for so long, he really brought the problem to the awareness of a wider audience who perhaps were not aware of these rumblings before. In the video, he details how the company was defensive over negative experiences with the brand, such as it causing skin irritation, something they said fundamentally could not be true because of how clean their product is. He goes into how they delete comments under Instagram posts or block the commenters, and so their socials are just an untrustworthy source of praise, and that Drunk Elephant mistreated influencers who discussed the positives and negatives of the brand by blocking them and removing them from PR lists, causing a power imbalance that feeds into their superiority complex. Shortly after, Cassandra Bankson also released a video about leaving the brand behind, going over several of the same points as Hiram, but also adding that the brand's view that all skin will behave the same if given non-toxic ingredients is fundamentally wrong, and that their naming story of the Marula fed drunken elephants is not true. She also retold the story of the patent infringement of SkinCeuticals and brought up their Glossier spat which exposed Drunk Elephant for creating fake accounts to slander their competitor, which was revealed after they forgot to change the accounts on a post posting directly from the Drunk Elephant account. However, to me, the most interesting point of the video is her fear that they would launch in China, which actually had begun happening a few months before she posted her video and in fact had been explicitly detailed as their plan in the acquisitional legal filings. But in fairness, her fear was not unfounded. Just in case you weren't aware, back in 2019-2020, in order to sell in mainland China, one was required to test on animals if they were planning to sell a non-special use, so skincare is included in this, product that was not made in China. This was a health and safety measure for them and was mandatory until the 1st of May 2021, so two years after the acquisition when the ban was lifted. However, the brand remained firm that their products were concurrent with their anti-cruelty stance, which either meant that they were a non-special use item produced in China or through a loophole to this rule in which if they sold in Hong Kong, which we do know that it was sold in Hong Kong, and just delivered to China, then the same testing processes would not be necessary. Just to be clear, it's significantly more likely that the second option there is what happened. From a Chinese perspective, it's clever. The product had intellectual market share there from those who had traveled before and people that had just seen it online. I remember my friends in Hong Kong at the time wanting to try it, but Drunk Elephant doing it this way allowed them to keep that cruelty-free branding inside the mainland as well as Hong Kong, which was something very novel for the mainland China market. 
Shishido, being Japanese and having traded in Asia for decades, clearly had put their knowledge of the region to good use with this, and it seemingly was successful, with netizens sharing their purchases online proudly. Plus, with the knowledge that vegan and cruelty-free products actually became a huge trend in China after the ban was lifted, it seems that they got into the region just in time without having to compromise their ethics. But meanwhile in the West, they were still going through the after-effects of their PR scandal. It's just by this point, at this scale, it wasn't enough to tank the business. They were still the market leader in non-toxic beauty after all, and Drunk Elephant was among some of the top brands in the industry on a wider scale. However, this wasn't the end of their downturn due to scandals after it continued into 2020 during the Black Lives Matter movement in which they claimed to be donating money to the cause and posted a black square but refused to disclose the diversity statistics of the company, which took many to think that the team was not diverse especially after it was discovered that Drunk Elephant were deleting comments pertaining to their lack of response. Really, it's due to these continued scandals that Drunk Elephant had its fall from grace in the West. It's still going pretty strong in China, so much as I can tell, but in the West we still seem to have a consensus that the brand today is in its fall era, hence the name of the video. But it's not really. When looking at the Google Trends information for the brand, we can see that the brand is doing better than ever, and if you did want to argue that it wasn't rising, if anything it could only be argued that they may be in a plateau. But it's certainly not really a fall. Though it should be said that in China and Asia in general, Google is really not used as much, so these searches from Google Trends are missing all of that data, which of course would affect results, as it's potentially that market that they've been using as a brand extender. So yes, for the moment, it seems that the brand is perhaps at a plateau in the West until there is another movement in their popularity, either for good or for worse. Drug Elephant had broken into the industry, reworking an existing product and expanding their concept to other skincare goods while using truly exceptional marketing. They had the founder's story, the story of the marula tree, their convoluted names, the term non-toxic, the suspicious six, a catchy brand name, a star ingredient that grew in popularity with the brand as well. They saw their first minor and major scandal, but it's still just early days for the company in which we're seeing many sources continue to tout them for their genuinely good product through 2021, 2022 and 2023, especially as they improve sustainability factors like their moisturizers, which now come in refillable pots. From here, really anything could happen to Drunk Elephant. They may continue to be quiet as they recover from the back-to-back -back scandals, or there just may be a time in which we see an improvement to their popularity. Really, it only takes one or two big name influencers or perhaps a celebrity to get the ball rolling and there's certainly a potential for the brand to return. Saying that, beauty is a famously fickle market, especially for these younger brands, so who knows, maybe they'll just be happy with their plateau and or just fade into obscurity. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. For more videos like this one but about fashion brands, please check out my fashion channel Understitch and for early access, my Patreon is linked below. An extra special thank you to those who do support on Patreon of course, some of whose names are on the screen now.